There are times when this world drifts so close to the fabric of reality that I can hear something calling me from beyond the veil. Sometimes when I get too close, I can feel that thing on the other side tugging at the corners of my mind. I'm worried about Carlos. Uh, he doesn't seem to be taking this so well. In case you don't know, I work at this shitty gas station at the edge of our small town. And weird things have been happening for as long as I've been here. I've only started to tell some of my stories, and if you haven't caught up, then I invite you to listen to the previous parts. When I returned to work after my post yesterday, I was delighted to find a sack of receipt papers sitting neatly on the register counter with notes written on them in shaky handwriting. I don't remember writing all the notes, but then again, I don't remember a lot of things. It is possible that I'm working too hard, or maybe the fumes coming from beneath the gas station are playing tricks on me. Or perhaps it's just another side effect of my condition. At any rate, I'm not one to look a gift horse in the mouth, or any other animal in any other orifice for that matter. Admittedly, my handwriting isn't the best, and at times the scratch on the receipt paper becomes nearly illegible, so if anything herein seems unbelievable, it's probably because I read it wrong. With that in mind, this is my best effort at a transcription. 7. It's getting dark earlier these days. 7.30 Farmer Jr. came into the gas station tonight, asking about the hand plants. I told him that they weren't there anymore. He left his number scribbled on the back of a coupon for 15% off bulk pig feed from an online retailer. I think he's trying to send me a message. 9. I think maybe some kids are playing a prank on me. I found a lawn gnome behind the pork rinds. I didn't think much about it and put him in a box behind the counter. But then I found another matching lawn gnome in the soda case. I added this one to the box as well. It wasn't until I noticed the third and fourth lawn gnomes that I started to suspect something. I had taken out the garbage and found the gnomes perched atop the branch of a tree next to the dumpster, staring down at me like gargoyles. I used a chair and broom to knock them down, and I put them in a box with the other three. When I got back to my desk, I found a note on my chair written in red ink. I don't know who wrote it, but the paper smells like oranges and plumeria. 10. There's a strange scratching noise coming from the tiles above the cash register. I fear Rocco and his brood may have infiltrated the building again. 11. Farmer Jr. called the store. He asked about the hand plants. I assured him that they weren't there anymore, and if they ever showed up again... I would call him. I think he's beginning to suspect that I'm lying. 12. One of the cultist recruits walked in from the community in the woods. Uh, they hate it when I call them cultists. I know the recruits aren't supposed to interact with the outside world, but from time to time they'll sneak into town, never any further than the gas station and buy cigarettes. They aren't supposed to try and recruit new members until they graduate to the honorable senior cultist status. But this one isn't a very good cultist. I know they aren't supposed to have names, but I'm going to call this one Marlboro. I'll let you guess why. Marlboro stayed in the store for at least an hour, trying to convince me to go back to the compound with him. They hate it when I call their home a compound. He tried to appeal to my logical side, but I let him know politely but firmly that I was not interested in logic. I can't remember when he left. 2. I found myself digging again. Sometimes, on slow nights, I let myself drift. My mind goes somewhere, and when I come to, I wonder, where was I just now? Who was that controlling my body while I was gone? My body does those things I've done so many times before that I guess it's learned how to do them without me. My body restocked the cigarettes, my body rotated the frozen drink machine, my body scraped the mold off the bottom of the ice buckets, my body emptied the rat traps, and somewhere along the way, found a shovel, went out back, and started digging a hole. Well, actually, I shouldn't say my body started digging. I have been, or rather, my body has been digging this hole off and on for the last few months. Usually, I come to after a few shovelfuls. This time, I added another foot deep before I snapped back to reality and asked myself, what the hell am I doing? 3.30 I just noticed a door at the end of the hallway past the walk-in cooler. 
How long have I worked here and never noticed that door before? It seems disappointingly ordinary as far as doors go, except for the fact that it's warm to the touch and feels like it's vibrating. I tried the handle, but it's locked. When I got back to my register, I noticed a man in a trench coat standing outside beyond the gas pumps, just outside the reach of our lights, dangerously close to the road. I can't tell if he's looking at me, or if he's looking past the building at the woods on the other side. I wish he wouldn't stand there like that, stoic and still, with his arms reaching down past his knees. The scratching against the tiles and the ceiling over the counter is getting louder. 345. A man came into the store, rolling a large ice chest behind him. He had sunken blue eyes, wiry hair coming from his nose and ears, long bony fingers and paper-thin skin, revealing every blue and green vein beneath the translucent dermis. He wore a bowler cap and smelled like milk. I'd definitely never seen him around before. He asked if I would be interested in partnering up with him. He sold ground meat at discount prices. But I told him that our store doesn't do well in the fresh foods category, recommending he try his hand at making jerky. Before he left, he scooped out about a pound or so of raw ground meat from his ice chest into a piece of parchment paper and gave it to me as a sample. Once he left, I took the meat into the cooler, where I found another lawn gnome waiting for me. I put the gnome into the box with the other seven. 4. Carlos just told me something very strange about Kiefer. 4.30. There's a kid named Spencer Middleton who went to the same high school as me and Kiefer. Spencer was just a year ahead of me, but looked much older and acted much younger. I live in a small town. Small towns get bored. For entertainment, some turn to gossip, some turn to more sinister pastimes. The latter often fueled the former. There were rumors around town that Spencer liked to torture and kill animals. Rumors that Spencer's parents and siblings always locked their bedroom doors when they went to sleep at night. The rumors didn't slow down any after the fire at Spencer's house, where Spencer was the only one who escaped unscathed. I once saw Spencer gleefully step on a lizard, throw his head back, and laugh. Some short time after his house caught fire for the second time, Spencer left town. The story went that he had gone off and joined the army. I didn't want to think about that, so I simply didn't think about that. I would have been perfectly happy to never think about that, but after all these years, I'm forced to, because Spencer Middleton just came into the store and bought a cup of coffee. He's sitting at one of the booths, talking to Kiefer. Marlboro's back. He asked if I could spare him some time to talk about his fake religion. They hate it when I call it a fake religion. I told him he had to leave. He seemed upset. 4.45. Spencer and Kiefer sat around for a while and didn't buy anything but two cups of coffee. When they finally left, I let Carlos know. He had been hiding under a blanket in the walk-in cooler, although I can't really understand why. Carlos explained to me exactly what happened. He finished his shift a couple of nights ago, and had just left the gas station when he saw Kiefer's SUV pulled over in a ditch at the bottom of the hill. Carlos, being the good guy he is, decided to check and see if Kiefer needed any help. He says that when he pulled up and got out of his car, he could hear what sounded like a loud crunching noise coming from just beyond the tree line. Carlos went to investigate. That's when he saw something. When I asked Carlos what he saw, he just started speaking Spanish in a fast, panicked sort of way. I don't speak Spanish, but I nodded along empathetically. The only word I could pick up was strega, which is the name of a liquor we carry. Whatever it was Carlos saw, it made him race back to his car as fast as he could and back out quickly without looking, and that's when he ran over Kiefer. Carlos is a good guy, but here he was in a bad situation. He stopped long enough to get out, chuck on Kiefer, and confirm that he was definitely dead. There was nothing he could do about it. There was nothing he could do to change that fact. It was an accident. Carlos was on parole. There was that thing in the woods, and Carlos had to make a decision. He heaved the body into the trunk of his car and drove off. Carlos took me to his car and showed me the body. I can confirm 100% that it was Kiefer in the trunk of his car. Not just because of his unmistakable face, but also because of his phone and wallet that were in his pockets. 5. I finally got tired of the scratching and pulled out a ladder from the storage to see what the raccoons were doing in the ceiling. But when I pushed back the tile, the only thing up there was another gnome. That makes a dozen so far. 6. 
The man in the trench coat was standing outside. The cultist came back, demanding an audience with me, insisting that if I would just listen to him, I would see that his reasoning is superb and flawless, and that I would be a fool not to join him in his perfection of logic and nirvana that is his belief structure. I agreed to listen to his pitch if he would agree to ask the man in the trench coat to leave. Our hasty verbal contract in place, I steeled myself to listen. Honestly, he did make a few good points, but... I suppose that's to be expected from a viral thought experiment strong enough to convince perfectly normal people to abandon their real lives and go live in the commune in the woods past the shitty gas station on the edge of town. They call themselves the Mathematists. They believe that humankind exists to fulfill two moral impravities, to decrease suffering and to increase happiness. A successful life increases happiness more than suffering. A decent life decreases suffering more than happiness. How good a person is can be determined by the spread between the happiness increased and the suffering decreased. Obviously, if the individual has a negative spread, that is, if they've increased happiness less than they've increased suffering, or if they've decreased suffering less than they've decreased happiness, then that means, very simply, that the individual is bad. Therefore, if an individual causes a tremendous amount of happiness and suffering, one can simply determine which was higher and use this perfect rubric to determine whether the individual was good or bad. Simple, right? The mathematists believe that the world has been going on about good and bad in the wrong way. For eons, we've been attempting to increase happiness, when instead, we should have been focusing on decreasing suffering, as happiness is a fluid concept. And the more happiness you create, the harder it is to sustain, as happiness has a clear set of diminishing return. Suffering, however is consistent. Suffering results from happiness coming to an end. Suffering is pure and eternal. For the mathematists to be supremely good, they must simply end all suffering. That is why the mathematists are working on a bomb to destroy the entire planet. By ending all life on Earth, they end an infinity of suffering into the future. With every life they avert, an entire lineage of people that would have been born into a life of suffering will no longer. Every death is a preemptive mercy killing. Every happy moment that will no longer occur pales in the face of all the sad moments that are likewise prevented. And so, as Marlboro explained, their murder cult believes that killing is a kindness. I told him that his ideas were stupid, and that he was stupid, and that now he had to go tell the man in the trench coat to go away. 6.30. The phone rang. This was strange for two reasons. First, because it was not the landline. It was the cell phone, even though we don't get cell phone service out here. And second, because it was the cell phone, the one that I took off Kiefer's body. I'll admit, I was stuck in a bit of a moral quandary ever since Carlos confided in me. On one hand, Carlos had killed someone. On the other, it was an accident and Carlos' parole officer may not see it that way. I thought I would have had more time to figure this out, but when the cell phone started ringing, I knew I had to make a decision. I answered it. I didn't speak first. The voice on the other end was one I recognized. You have something that belongs to my boss. It was Spencer Middleton. His cell phone, uh, his wallet, I answered. What? No? We don't care about that shit. We can buy more cell phones. We can get more wallets. You know what we want. He was right. I did. Uh, it was an accident, I explained. We know. We want to make a deal. You give it back, and we pretend this whole thing didn't happen. Can, can we do that? Absolutely. 7.30. Carlos came in for his shift half an hour ago, and I explained the deal to him. He wasn't thrilled, but as I laid it out very clearly, he didn't have a choice. We parked Carlos's Camry behind the gas station near the growth of hand plants and made a point to stand far enough away from them not to get our ankles grabbed. Kiefer's SUV drove up a few minutes later. Spencer was driving. He and Kiefer got out without a word, sized us up, opened up the back of the vehicle. Carlos popped his trunk. Kiefer and I stared at each other, keeping eye contact the whole time while Carlos and Spencer transferred the body from one vehicle to the other. Spencer had a tarp and blanket ready to wrap everything up. When it was over, Kiefer put a hand on my shoulder and whispered in my ear, You done good. Then they left. Carlos started crying as I went back inside the store. 
It was almost daytime, and that's when the new part-timer is supposed to come in. 8. The new part-timer is late, and I'm overdue for a lunch break. I made the best of my extra time here by putting price stickers on all of the lawn gnomes. We're ringing them up as miscellaneous grocery for $9.99 each. Hey, I've already sold a couple. I'm a really good employee. 8.30. I went to the bathroom and saw a man standing there with his jeans at his ankles. He wore red and white checkered boxers and a cowboy hat. He smiled when he saw me and simply said in a somewhat sing-song voice, Come on, man. Come on with it. I took the opportunity to ask him something that had been burning at the back of my mind. Do you know, is, is everything going to be okay? The bathroom cowboy took a second to think, then he pulled up his pants, fastened his enormous belt buckle, and walked past me, spurs clicking on the bathroom tile. He stopped for a second when he was right next to me and said plainly, I appreciate it. Then he left. I honestly have no idea what that means. These are the entirety of the receipt paper notes, but I did make a point to continue keeping the journal. I think this will be a healthy way of chronicling the weird events at the gas station. Maybe this will even help with my condition. I don't know. The next time something strange happens, maybe I'll come back and write more. Until then, I guess this is to be continued. Edit. Uh, sorry. Upon further inspection, I realized that some of the scribbles on the receipt paper may have been transcribed incorrectly. I also made some adjustments to the spelling and fixed some typos. While I was at it, I added another typo just for the observant reader. Lastly, upon the advice of some of my readers, I removed the part where I listed Farmer Jr.'s social security number and address. Also, special thanks to the reader that pointed out that strega isn't even a Spanish word. I asked Carlos about it when he came in for the fourth shift today, but... Carlos simply looked at me blankly and told me that he doesn't speak Spanish. I should begin this entry by saying how truly sorry I am to anyone who read part 4. I had no idea that was going to happen. The agents have assured me that every trace of the story has been removed from the internet, and that there is nothing to worry about. If you are unfortunate enough to read part 4, I beg you, for your own sake, try to forget everything. If you experience nosebleeds, dizziness, migraines, or hallucinations, go immediately to the emergency room. If you have a reoccurring dream of an island made of song, under no circumstances should you approach or attempt to open the blue door with the painting of a crow on it. If you did not read part 4, there is no part 4. It doesn't exist. Forget you ever heard of it. By now, you probably already know that there is a shitty gas station at the edge of our small town. And weird things have been happening here. And weird things have been happening there. The city council has personally asked me to stop talking about it, as there have been some astute readers that have not only tracked down our small town from the brief description I've given, but actually come to visit me at work. I heard that one of them joined the mathematists. And as far as I know, the other two are still missing. Once again, I'm sorry. I'm not working right now. It's the first legitimate break I've had since I started writing my stories on the receipt papers all that time ago. Time moves funny here, flowing slow and fast all at once, like molasses out of a shotgun. It's a good thing I've been keeping a journal. I've got a few moments before my laptop dies, and I think now would be the perfect time to transpose my journal entries before the battery runs out or the blood loss gets to me. Right now, it's a race to see what happens first. Before any of you worry, I've already called Tom. He said he's on his way to give me a ride to the hospital, right after he picks up dinner for the Ledford orphans, John, Ben, and little sister. Tom and the other deputies have been taking turns checking in and bringing them food in an attempt to make the whole thing less tragic. They've been living on their own ever since the incident that uh, totally didn't happen, and... Anyone that says otherwise is a damned liar. There I go again. Off on another tangent. I guess I'll get to it and type up the journal entries while I still can. 11.02.2017. 9 p.m. So much has happened here since the Halloween incident that we aren't allowed to talk about. I've been much busier than usual, dealing with the aftermath as well as the cult. The mathematists have been cleaning out our inventory on a daily basis planning ahead for some kind of secret event that I only get to hear about in hushed mutterings and whispers. 
Night is coming earlier, and the weather is getting colder. 11.03, 2017. 2 a.m. The man in the trench coat is back. He's standing just outside the gas station door, staring in. He's been there for almost an hour now. On the bright side, I haven't had a customer come in since he showed up. On the not-so-bright side, I can't help but feel like he's trying to put thoughts in my head. He won't be able to, though. I've had way too much practice. Kiefer came in earlier today, before the sun went down, and sat in the booth drinking coffee for a while. Eventually, Spencer Middleton showed up. Spencer had a word with Kiefer, then came storming up to my register, screaming at the top of his lungs. He grabbed the display of lotto scratch-offs and threw it across the room. It was obvious that something had upset him, and that's when I took the earplugs out. Uh, is everything okay? I asked him. I knew damn well that everything was never okay. Did you hear a word I said? Spencer asked. I explained to him that I had taken to wearing earbugs in an effort to drown out the sounds of screaming that periodically radiate throughout the air vents. I guess the screams must have stopped a while ago, or maybe I imagined them. Either way, I didn't need the earplugs anymore. At this point, Tom walked into the store, his white hair looking even whiter than normal. Spencer, I could see, became instantly aware of the deputy's presence. Where is he? He half whispered, half growled. Where's the other one? Carlos? I asked. Spencer sighed. Sh sure, Carlos. Uh, he's not due for another 20 minutes. When he gets here, tell him that we need to have a chat. With that, Spencer Middleton let out a shrill whistle and left the store. Kiefer jumped up out of his seat and followed close behind. Tom helped me pick up the mess and put the lotto display back together without asking a single question. I wish more people could be like Tom. When Carlos got to work, he told me that he had been having strange dreams. Dreams of something enormous, living, breathing, underground. The dreams always end the same way, with the gas station collapsed into a giant sinkhole. I told him that Spencer was looking for him. That's when Carlos grew solemn and asked if he could show me something. In the freezer, behind a stack of boxes labeled non a prairie whatever the hell that means, they've been here for as long as I've worked here, there is a moving blanket. And inside the blanket, there's another kefir. My first question for Carlos was, you stole the body back? He looked at the ground and shook his head sheepishly like a toddler that got busted for cooking meth. You killed another one, I asked. Carlos explained it was an accident. Again. 3 a.m. The man in the trench coat is finally gone. He left claw marks on the glass of the front door. I checked the security footage to confirm my suspicions. He always stays just outside the range of our cameras. Why can't I remember what his face looks like? 3.30 a.m. Marlboro was the first customer in the store after the man in the trench coat left. I told him I was surprised he was still alive. He mistook that for a compliment and said, thank you. I asked him if he was ready for the big event, but then he just stared at me blankly. I could tell that he had no idea what I was talking about, so I filled him in on how I figured it all out. The unusual cultist activity, the whispers, the buying up of all of our supplies. I could tell that something was about to happen. Marlboro went pale in the face as I was talking, then ran out of the gas station before I could finish. The 99 cent frozen drink still in his hand. I know I should write up an inventory loss slip for the theft, but I just can't bring myself to do it. As hard as it is to explain, there's something about Marlboro makes me feel genuinely sorry for him. 6 a.m. I caught myself digging again. I don't know how long I was out there, or who was running the store while I was gone. The hole was so deep that now I nearly couldn't climb out on my own. I should maybe think about considering the possibility of one day asking a doctor if this is normal. 8 a.m. Marlboro is currently crying in the dry storage closet. Through his sobs, I can barely make out the story. Marlboro was sent on some kind of vision quest for the last week and had no idea what the other cultists had been stocking up for. When he went back to the compound earlier tonight, he found the whole place was completely deserted. Beds were left unmade. Some plates had food on them. A fire still burning in the fireplace. Everyone's clothes were still in their personal milk crates next to their sleeping bags. But the people, all of them, were simply gone. Marlboro wasn't taking this very well. 
but I have a business to run, so I asked Carlos to help me carry him into the dry storage area. I figured he can work through some of the stuff in there, and then maybe when he's done, he'll just, I don't know, go home? 11.04.2017. 9 p.m. The exterminators just left. They say they got all the snakes this time, but I have my doubts. 11.05.2017. 5 p.m. Kiefer came into the store again today, made some thinly veiled threats. He asked about Carlos, too, but I told him that I was tired of being the go-to between them, and that if he had business with Carlos, he needed to take it up with Carlos. That's when Kiefer started getting... weird. You know this place is just a big experiment, and you're the little mouse? I asked Kiefer to buy something or leave, so he bought a pack of toothpaste and then started to undress in the store and rub the toothpaste on his naked body. They say that something's wrong with your brain. Is that true? I tried to be polite and avert my eyes as I answered. Yeah. You have uh, some kind of mental condition? I answered again. Yeah. That's too bad. At this point, Kiefer was completely naked. He walked over to the frozen drink machine and filled a large cup with a sugary red concoction before turning it upside down on the top of his head. Then he shook himself violently like a wet dog, flinging bits of cold, sticky debris across everything from the ceiling to the walls, some of it even landing on my face. But I tried not to let him see me flinch. I knew that this was all just an attempt to intimidate me, and I didn't want to give him the satisfaction. What is it exactly? He asked me as he crossed back to where his pile of clothes were waited for him. What? I asked. What's your condition? Paranoia? Schizophrenia? Begay? No, I answered. I don't sleep. You don't sleep? He sounded genuinely interested. Like, ever? No, I can't sleep. I haven't slept a single day since high school. It's a rare genetic condition with no cure and no treatment, and one day it will kill me. But until then, I handle the effects as best I can. Kiefer nodded. That must be it. That must be why he can't reach you. Why who can't reach me? Right then, Spencer came into the store. He threw a blanket around Kiefer and ushered him out to the waiting SUV. A moment later, he came back into the store and offered me a hundred dollars for the security tape from tonight. I wonder what I'll spend my hundred bucks on. 9 p.m. I was beginning to suspect something wasn't quite right with the store. I'd been finding empty candy bar wrappers strewn about. Security's tapes mysteriously deleted, strange noises coming through the walls in the middle of the night when I should be alone. At least, more strange noises than usual. At first, I assumed it was just the raccoons. But now I know the truth. Now I know that Marlboro has been living here for the last two days. He just walked out of the supply closet wearing a bathrobe, nodded at me, and then grabbed a stick of meat jerky, and then went into the bathroom. It had not even occurred to me that Marlboro had never left. 11.06.2017 4 a.m. It finally happened. I suppose that it was only a matter of time. I know I should feel regret or shame or any of the other emotions normal people feel after something like this happens, but all I feel is embarrassed. I came to a couple hours ago with a shovel in my hand. I had been digging again, and this time I had made some serious progress. The hole was at least seven feet deep, the steep walls made of loose red clay, it took me a while to realize that I was staring up into an inky black night peppered with uncountable stars. When some of the bigger celestial bodies started to move, I realized that the stars were actually just the soulless red eyes of mutant raccoons staring down at me over the edge of the hole, probably looking for food. Those shameless beggars. I chucked the shovel out of the hole, and that's when I heard it. Imagine the sound of a butcher's knife hitting a watermelon, like a solid wet thwack. Now, imagine the watermelon gurgling and falling over like a sack of potatoes. Oh, wait. Oh, man, this, this metaphor is really getting out of hand. When I climbed out of the hole, I saw the shovel standing upright, the business end firmly planted inside the open chest wound of a still-twitching kefir. The kefir was dead before I got to his side. In a final act of defiance, he had turned both of his middle fingers up to me, I felt just the slightest amount of respect for him before I went into a mental state that I can only describe as subdued panic. 
The first thing I wanted to do was find something to wrap the body in because surely Spencer Middleton would come for it soon. When I went into the gas station, I was surprised to find that Marlboro had taken it upon himself to work the cash register while I was gone. He was ringing up one of our regulars, Charles, a great big fat man that always buys soap and boiled peanuts. I nabbed a tarp off the shelf and took it outside. That's when I learned something. Kiefer's heavy, like really heavy. I understand that a human body is basically just a meaty, fleshy water balloon full of guts and excrement, but nothing could prepare me for how leaky and gross and heavy a dead man can be. It was only by some miracle that I managed to drag Kiefer through the back door and into the freezer without being seen. It took all of my strength to pull the mass behind the boxes and onto a sack of the other three, and even the cold of the freezer wasn't enough to keep me cool. As I stood there letting my breath come back to me and adrenaline wear off, I took stock of my situation. That's when it dawned on me. There were four Kiefers in that freezer. Four Kiefers. Where the hell did the other two come from? The freezer door opened and Marlboro entered, dragging a dead Kiefer by the legs. He stopped and made eye contact with me. When he saw the Kiefer at my feet, I said the only thing I could think of. Well, this is awkward. Marlboro and I decided to open a bottle of Strega liquor and have a few drinks. He explained to me that he had accidentally killed Kiefer a couple of times. I totally understood. The guy's just so easy to kill. At one point, Carlos came into the freezer to grab a box of cookie dough. He didn't even acknowledge all the Kiefers. My laptop battery is currently at 2%. It's obvious now that I won't have time to transcribe the rest of my journals before it dies. I don't have time to tell you how I ended up at the bottom of this hole underneath the store with a broken leg, but I can tell you that I hear someone moving around above me, which is good because I don't think I'm alone down here. If you're reading this, it means I managed to upload my story. If you're not reading this, then I, I don't even know. What even are you? Someone just called my name from the top of the precipice. I think it's Carlos. I wonder what happened to Tom. Why didn't Tom ever show up? Come to think of it, I seem to remember Tom didn't survive the Halloween incident. Wait, who the hell have I been talking to this entire time? Uh, I promise that if I survive long enough to recharge my battery, I'll come back and tell the rest. Until then, I guess this is to be continued.